In our gospel reading this Sunday, Jesus is talking with his disciples. And of course, that's no surprise. But what might come as a surprise is that they, they being the disciples, were arguing about who was the greatest. Now, by this point, they have walked with Jesus. They have talked with Jesus. They have been taught by Jesus. They have saw the lived example of his life. Jesus has made it abundantly clear in no uncertain terms that he came not to be served, but that he came to serve. Jesus has uh, submitted himself to John the Baptist and been baptized by one who recognized that actually Jesus should have been baptizing him. And Jesus declared, but I must do this to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus has answered the prayers of Gentiles, a, a people group who, uh, according to the Jewish tradition of his day, were beneath him and were considered unworthy to be served by Jesus, the great master and teacher. And so when you really think about it, it is actually quite odd that the disciples would be arguing about who was the greatest. And yet in our reading from the book of Mark, chapter nine, that is exactly what we find happening. And so, instead of giving them a straightforward answer, <laughs> and if you know anything about the Gospels, you know Jesus rarely, if ever, gives a straightforward answer, even to his beloved disciples. Uh, Jesus proceeds with uh, an object lesson, a parable, but not his usual uh, little story or metaphor. He actually takes a living, breathing person, uh, a little child, it says in the text. And not only does he call forth this little child, but the text says that he takes the child in his arms. In this beautiful display of human intimacy with the divine person of God in Jesus Christ. Jesus proceeds to say this. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Now, again, remember the question that had originally been put forth. The question that the disciples were asking was what, or rather who, is the greatest? So, in other words, uh, Peter, may have been asking, well, Jesus, is John the one who's always 
uh, 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 by your side, at your bosom, as the text often says. Is, is he the greatest? Or, or perhaps John was asking, uh, Lord, is, 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 is Judas the greatest? I mean, after all, he does handle your money. So, you know, I, I just assume Judas is, is, is probably the greatest. And, and perhaps Judas was asking, uh, uh, well, is it Peter? Because Peter is always the one who speaks up. And on and on we can imagine the scenario going. Twelve disciples standing around asking who among us is the greatest. Now, as I said earlier, this is an odd question when you consider the character of Jesus and his ministry. Yet here they are asking the question. And if we're honest, we often find ourselves asking the same question. Lord, who among us is the greatest? Is it the pastor? Is it the priest? Is it the uh, person who gives the most money in the church? Is it the politician down the street? Is it the president in the White House? Is it uh, uh, the business owner downtown? Is it the tycoon on Wall Street? Who among us is the greatest? Is it the doctor? Is it the lawyer? Is it the accountant? Is it the uh, whatever profession you can think of that is, is often treated with respect? Or is it the stay-at-home mom? Is it the loving husband? Is it the uh, child who sacrifices everything for an aging parent? Who among us is the greatest if we're honest we all ask this question we can't help but ask this question it's in our dna if you will it's in our cultural heritage even though scripture clearly teaches us not to compare ourselves unfortunately it is a sin that we often succumb to we just can't help it we are constantly and consistently comparing ourselves to ourselves we are constantly and consistently asking this strange question who among us is the greatest and unfortunately we don't just stop there with the question of who is the greatest as we read in james chapter 3 we, we take this way beyond question asking. No, we begin to fight and to uh, 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 attack one another for the title of greatest among us. James says it this way. If you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts do not be boastful and false to the truth such wisdom does not come from above but is earthly unspiritual devilish for where there is envy and selfish ambition there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind now, as harsh as that may sound, when we think about it, isn't it the truth that as we ask this question, who is the greatest among us? And we try to answer that question by wrangling and wrestling for the title of greatest among us. We end up finding ourselves behaving quite unspiritually, quite earthly, and dare I say, quite devilish. Our envy and what ultimately becomes selfish ambition as we are fighting for this title of the greatest leads to disorder and wickedness of every kind. Disordered thoughts, disordered lives, disordered relationships, disordered emotions, disordered health sometimes, wickedness of every kind. 
because we want to be the greatest. And it seems that often we will sacrifice anything, everything, and everyone for the title. But is this really wise? Is this wisdom from above? James says, no, this, this, this is not wisdom. This is not understanding. And it certainly is not the wisdom from above. It's not the wisdom of God. James says the, the wisdom of God, the wisdom from above is first, first, pure. And then not only is it pure, but it's peaceable. It's, it, it, it's not about fighting and wrangling for the title. James says it's gentle, willing to yield. See, the wisdom from below, the wisdom of the world wants to take. But the wisdom of God, the wisdom from above is willing to yield. The wisdom of, from below, the wisdom of the world wants to take vengeance, wants to bring about violence. But the wisdom from above, the wisdom of God is full of mercy and good fruits. And so in our epistle and in our gospel, we have this contrast between the wisdom of God and the wisdom of the world. We have this contrast between how God, how Christ would have us pursue greatness and how the world, and dare I say even how the devil would have us pursue greatness. See, the disciples were pursuing greatness by wrestling for it, by wrangling for it, by trying to argue who among them was the greatest. But Jesus says, no, 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 you've got it all wrong. Jesus changes the narrative. Jesus changes the perspective and he says, you don't need to wrestle and wrangle and fight for the title of who will be the greatest. He says, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. Now it would be one thing if Jesus just said this as a meaningless platitude, but Jesus lived this. Jesus was the greatest servant of all. Jesus served not only until it hurt, but Jesus served until it cost him his life. And so in his teaching, in his life, in his death, and lastly, in his resurrection, Jesus taught and proved that greatness is not something to be chased and wrestled at for. But greatness is something that comes when you put relationship first. Now, am I just saying this because it sounds good or is this really what the text means? Well, let's read it again. Remember the question that the disciples put forth to Jesus was, who among us is the greatest? And Jesus' response, Jesus' answer, Jesus' first words to the disciples was the following. Listen, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. Now remember, not only is Jesus answering their question with words, but Jesus is answering their question with actions. Before Jesus utters a word, this te the text tells us that he took a little child and put it among them. And taking it, 
taking this little child in his arms, he said to them. So he showed them with his actions, with this very clear act of human intimacy to take a child and to hold a child in his arms, that it is relationship that matters most to God. Relationship that makes one the greatest. And if they missed it, if they missed the lesson that was present in Jesus' holding of the child and taking up the child in his arms, then he said it. He said, whoever welcomes a child welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, Jesus says, welcomes the one who sent me. Who's that? The Father. And so not only is Jesus referencing relationship between humans, but Jesus is referencing the relationship between Christ and the Father, between himself and God. It's all about relationship. See, Jesus and the Father never wrestled about who was the greatest. Because Jesus' only impulse, Jesus' only action, Jesus' only desire was constantly and consistently his relationship with the Father. When it all came down to the final decision, the final choice, the, the point of no return, the Garden of Gethsemane, literally, when Jesus was faced with his final hours, or rather his final days that would lead to his final hours. Jesus had to make a choice. Would he put power at the front? Would he put his own survival to the fore? Would he put being the greatest above everything and everyone, even his heavenly father? Or would he lay it all down? Would he put relationship, not only with humanity, but relationship with his father before everything and everyone? And oh, we know the story. We know the answer. Jesus did put relationship with humanity and relationship with his father before everything, even his own life. And we know from scripture and we many of us know from the experience in our own lives that God the Father answered Jesus's sacrificial answer a, a response with the resurrection the resurrection tells us and shows us that when you put relationship first Death has no power. When you put relationship first, you will have a legacy of wisdom, a legacy of understanding, a legacy of greatness. Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.